Welcome back to WD FM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. We're your hosts, Bree Bertolaccini, marketing manager, and Chris Mullen, marketing and editorial specialist at the Walt Disney Family Museum. Happy 100th anniversary to the Walt Disney Company. This is a really big month and a big centennial celebration, so it's exciting to ring in that 100th anniversary here on this podcast today. So I thought to kick off this episode, um, why don't we share a special Disney memory or moment that you cherish? Yeah, well, so a a special Disney memory I cherish is actually the first Disney memory that I can recall, uh, which was seeing Mulan in theaters with my aunt. Uh, We were sitting entirely too close to the screen, and I had really sensitive ears, so I was covering them for most of the movie until my aunt ran down a poor usher to get them to turn down the volume. Uh, This aunt is no longer with us, so uh, setting me memorably on my Disney journey is a connection with her that I'll always cherish. So that's, that's my Disney memory. I love that. And what from that movie, like what's your favorite song for Mulan? Uh, that's really tough. I, I, I've recently picked, uh, I'll make a man out of you. Uh, but like, I also love true to your heart. Cause I love end credit songs, the nineties end credit songs. I feel like that had a really big impact on my, my music taste going forward. Also a girl worth fighting for the, yeah. the way that that like sets up, uh, you know, the the conflict between Mulan and the others in her unit uh, where they're not aware, but she's aware. And then at the end, you know, the, the song ends, A Girl Worth Fighting, and that has the double meaning there with Mulan. So uh, I, I'd, I'd say it's it's somewhere a three-way tie. The Matchmaker song's good. I mean, they're all they're all good songs. Mulan has an amazing soundtrack. It does. It it does. It's, you know, the, the other, like, there are other films of that time that get a lot of press for having good soundtracks, Aladdin, The Lion King, Beauty and the Beast. Uh, but I mean, right, right all the way through the end of the 90s, too, they just did not miss with those. Yeah. And Mulan is a, a special one in that the songs, I feel like, have an emotional and character arcs that happen throughout almost every song. Um, where a lot of other movies, like I feel like Aladdin, there's not as much uh, character development that happens. Like they're fun songs, but like um, Make a Man Out of You, you get the whole arc of Mulan being able to climb that totem pole at the very end and, you know, working through that. So I just feel like the the music has such an impact. I, that's what I always take away from Mulan and the soundtrack. And like those songs make me feel like so powerful and like, oh, I can do these things because by the end, Mulan has achieved something or found something within herself that she can do. I totally agree. Well, what's what's the memory that you have? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'll just be a little cheesy here for a second. Uh, <laughs> but something I do, I really hold dear, near and dear to my heart was finding the Walt Disney Family Museum. I mean, it's obviously my job, but I already have a job, so I don't need to suck up to the boss or anything. <laughs> but so th- this truly does come from the heart. Um, but I was uh, going to school in San Fran- at San Francisco State University and you know, I kind of wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And I was just kind of missing a little Disney, a uh, little Disney magic. And I was originally from Southern California, so I could just hop on over to Disneyland when I wanted to, but didn't have that freedom in San Francisco. So I just remember one day I was at a bus stop and I looked up and there was a Mary Blair street pole banner um, for the exhibition at the Walt Disney Family Museum. And I remember Googling it right away and I didn't even think about visiting. I just remember making the inquiry that I wanted to be a volunteer. And I just knew I needed to be more involved than a visitor. And so really the museum just kind of changed my life. And I changed my major to be in marketing, to hopefully get a job at the museum. And um, that was now over nine years ago. So (laughs) the fact that I'm still so inspired by Walt Disney's story and kind of sharing his legacy is just, it's remarkable to me. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, finding the museum was really a magical moment for me and has since just kind of opened so many doors and like doing this podcast with you, Chris. So I, I, you know, the ultimate Disney magic, the Walt Disney Family Museum. I love that. For me, my moment of finding the museum was actually watching Saving Mr. Banks. Oh, uh, wow. I, I discovered it in kind of reading about the making of the movie and then found out that the museum was here in the city. I, you know, I'm from the East Bay, uh, you know, had family in the city, so it would be over every so often, but definitely didn't spend any time in the Presidio in my youth and didn't know that the museum was there. And uh, that movie really um, not only told me that the museum was here, but also really inspired me into pursuing Disney history. And then I just started consuming any, any biographies, any books that I could, and really just wanted to be a part of it. And I found the museum at the perfect time. And here I am. 
yeah, that's so incredible. I do remember when Saving Mr. Banks came out. I I was like so obsessed with it. And on my first tour through the museum, I'm the volunteer coordinator at the time. He uh, told me that Tom Hanks visited the museum, and I was like, whoa this museum brings in the big guns, like, you know, it's not just a small museum, like people in the Disney community, obviously really, um, you know, cherish this museum. And so I was like, wow, like, stars can be found here. (laughs) So I just remember being very starstruck by that Tom Hanks had been had sat on on the Griffith Park bench with Diane Disney Miller, to kind of research the role. Totally Oakland's own Tom Hanks. Yes, that's right. I forgot he's a Bay Area native. Well, uh, Disney's, you know, a symbol that for so many has represented magic, wonder, inspiration, and innovation, among so many other things. Something that Diane herself championed when creating the Walt Disney Family Museum was to make sure that people knew the man behind the name Disney. Luckily, at the Walt Disney Family Museum, we don't need a centennial anniversary to celebrate the founding of the company or the Disney legacy. Anytime you visit our museum, you can celebrate those achievements in our galleries. So I think that's really cool, too. Well, that was such a great way to kick off our museum update. So let's get into it. Now, at the museum this month, we are ringing in the spooky season and our latest special exhibition, Disney Cats and Dogs, with a month-long screening of Frankenweenie, a story about a young boy who conducts a science experiment to bring his beloved, dearly departed dog back to life. You can visit our calendar for information on screening times. That's going to be a shocking good time. Just remember to leave the nightlight on for this studio series. The closet at home can feel like a simple place to store your stuff, hang clothes, or hide your laundry in. But at night, it becomes a doorway into another world. For this ghastly workshop, Animate a Monster in a Closet, we examine the lore of monsters in the closet and how they have entered our world through animation. Afterwards, follow along as we create a creature peeking out from behind the door. Adult and youth animation classes are available on Saturday, October 28th. So visit our calendar for more information on these wonderful studio series. Everybody scream for 30 years of the Pumpkin King. Join us on Sunday, October 29th in celebration of the 30th anniversary of Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas with a panel of experts, including director Henry Selleck, assistant production coordinator Kat Alyoshin, and animator Anthony Scott. This discussion will be moderated by set and model builder Todd Lookinland. Get your tickets soon because it's sure to be a hot (laughs) seller. Thank you. That was great. I am very excited for this program. I mean, Henry Selleck, that's like an animation director legend. So the stop motion that he's done is just incredible. So I think this will be a hot commodity at the museum. I can't wait. Well, join us on Saturday, November 4th in welcoming Greg and Jeff Sherman, the sons of multiple Academy Award and Grammy Award winning composers Richard and Robert Sherman, known as the Sherman Brothers. It'll be so exciting. Greg and Jeff will share stories about their father's career as part of a prolific sibling songwriting team, expand on their own experiences in the entertainment industry, and delve into their process writing, directing, and producing The Boys, the Sherman Brothers story, came out in 2009. For all programs, visit our calendar to learn more. If you want to be the first to know about our upcoming programs, you can sign up for our email newsletter by heading to our website. And at the bottom of every page is a sign-up link. Due to popular demand, our Disney Cats and Dogs special exhibition has been extended. Visit uh, the Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall uh, between now and June 2nd, 2024 to experience it in person. Well, in celebration of 100 years of the Walt Disney Company, we are opening the museum vault with some never-before-seen objects. Now, for a limited time, you could see the letter from Walt to Virginia Davis's mother, convincing the family to move from Kansas City to Hollywood. Now, this letter was written on the day Walt and Roy signed a contract with distributor Margaret J. Winkler, and it is the official day of the company's founding, October 16, 1923. Now, this will be the first object in the series, and this is the first time this particular object will be on display. We currently have the facsimile on display, so you can read both sides of the letter. So this will be a really cool artifact to be able to see in person. So stay tuned for more information. It's going to be really cool to see that come out of the vault. And speaking of our collection... Now it's time for our collections clash. Each month, Bree and I face off at the topic and each pick three objects where you, the listener, votes on your favorite. Let's look back at last month's picks. The topic was cameras in our museum. Round one was between my pick of the multiplane camera and Bree's pick of Walt's Kodak Instamatic camera. The multiplane won the round with 75% of the votes and Walt's camera received 25% of the votes. 
for round two, it was between my pick of the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea underwater camera and Chris's pick of the Circorama camera. It was a tight vote. The underwater camera received 47% of the votes, and the Circorama camera won the round with 53% of the votes. For the final round, it was between my pick of the Technicolor DF7 camera and Bree's pick of the Bell & Howell camera. It was a photo finish round. Well done, Bree. Uh, with the same margin as round two, my pick of the Technicolor camera received 47% of the votes, and Bree's pick of the Bell & Howell camera received 53% of the votes. Congrats, Chris, on your win. I am definitely on a losing streak here, so I don't want to count how many months I've lost in a row, but here's to hoping that I'm luckier this time around. Good luck. I really think this month is going to be your month. <laughs> uh, this month, we are celebrating the founding of the Walt Disney Company. In July 1923, Walt Disney's initial foray into film production ended in failure as the Laughagram Film Studio in Kansas City collapsed. However, before filing for bankruptcy, the studio had completed production of Alice's Wonderland, a pilot cartoon for the Alice Comedies series which featured a live-action Alice in an animated world known as Cartoonland. With the finished reel in hand, Walt sold his film camera and put the money towards a one-way, first-class train ticket to California. After arriving in Los Angeles in August, Walt attempted to find employment in live-action filmmaking, but soon returned to animation, setting out to find a distributor for the Alice comedies. Just a few months later, Walt and his older brother Roy went into business with M.J. Winkler Productions, the company of pioneering film producer Margaret J. Winkler, to produce and distribute the first 12 installments in the Alice comedies series. The contract with Winkler Productions marked the founding of the Disney Brothers cartoon studio, which we know today as the Walt Disney Company on October 16th, 1923. In 1928, after Walt realized he didn't own the rights to Oswald, he created a new character, Mickey Mouse. Now with Mickey's global success, it established the Walt Disney Company as a successful animation company. Walt created an experimental short series after the success of Mickey Mouse, and it was called The Silly Symphonies, to improve his animator skills. This experimentation led to Disney's first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Now, this completely changed animation forever, and years later, Walt remarked, quote, I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. With that quote, this month's topic for our collections clash is inspired by it, and the topic is, it was all started by dot dot dot. So Chris and I will each pick three objects that represent the start of something significant in the Walt Disney Company. Now, Chris, since you won, kick us off. Well, our theme this month is It All Started With, which gives us some flexibility to decide what that means to us. But the quote ends with a mouse. So my first pick is obviously going to be something Mickey Mouse related. We talk about the earliest known drawing of Mickey and Minnie all the time, so I figured it would be fairer to go instead with a sketch of Plain Crazy that we have on display. While Steamboat Willie was the first widely released Mickey Mouse short film, Plain Crazy was produced first and shown for test audiences while Walt was looking for a new distributor. This short film established who Mickey Mouse was and provided the framework for later short films to follow. In a way, it all started with Plain Crazy. I love that, Chris. I think that was such a great way to kick us off. And I thought for this round, maybe I would go head to head with you um, and also challenge you on the it all started with a mouse. Uh, <laughs> so for my first pick, I'm also picking a mouse inspired pick. It all started with Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Now I'm going with the marionettes that we have on display with the ultimate animated power couple. So the two marionettes is of Mickey and Minnie Mouse, and it looks like they're holding hands. So Walt said in 1933 about the couple, which this is one of my favorite quotes, quote, in private life, Mickey is married to Minnie. A lot of people have written to him asking this question because sometimes he appears to be married to her in his films and other times still courting her. What it really amounts to is that Minnie is, for screen purposes, his leading lady, end quote. I like that you have your screen persona and then, you know, like when you go into Toontown, you go into Mickey's house and Minnie's house, you know, they're. And then at the runaway railway, you know, those are their acting careers on display. Mickey and his leading lady, I would be remiss to mention that it was Walt's leading lady who helped name Mickey Mouse at the start. So on the train ride back from New York, Walt had pitched the name Mortimer Mouse. And thankfully, Lillian was there to suggest the name Mickey. Well, the rest is history. So this was the round of the mouse. <laughs> 
Great pick. Great pick. Well, I mean, we had to go with following the quote. So I'm glad that yeah. we, we got the mouse <laughs> out of the way. Since it is a snake style draft, you have the next pick. All right. For my next pick, I'm going with the Griffith Park bench where it all started for Disneyland. <laughs> Good pick. Well, Sundays in the Disney household were deemed Daddy's Day, and Walt would take his two daughters, Diane and Sharon, to Griffith Park in Los Angeles to ride the carousel. Walt shared, quote, Disneyland came about when my daughters were very young, and Saturday was always Daddy's Day. I'd take them to the merry-go-round, and I'd sit on a bench. I felt there should be something built where the parents and children could have fun together. So that's how Disneyland started. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them and he could have a little fun with them too, end quote. Now, this daydream eventually coalesced into Disneyland Park and opened a prolific chapter in both Walt Disney's life and the company's history. The bench at the end of our gallery where you can see the Golden Gate Bridge, this was gifted to Diane Disney Miller by Griffith Park when they were renovating the benches in the park. The exact bench Walt sat on while dreaming of what would become Disneyland may never be known. So we don't know if he sat on this exact bench, but it's one of many. Well, that was a great pick. And I'm also going to follow your lead and go with something Disneyland related. For my second pick, I'm doing the robot. (laughs) Uh, Just kidding. I'm going with the bust and metal frame of the Abraham Lincoln figure for Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, which premiered at the 1964-65 New York World's Fair before being brought to Disneyland, where it continues to captivate audiences today. Now, Lincoln was not the first audio animatronics figure, or even the first fully audio animatronics attraction, but it was the first figure of its kind. Prior figures added to Jungle Cruise and Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland were more rudimentary figures, and Lincoln proved the promise of audio animatronics, bringing to life a complex, life-sized human figure. The mind-blowing figures of today, like Kylo Ren in Rise of the Resistance, the Navi Shaman and Navi River Journey at Disney's Animal Kingdom, or Spider-Man flying over Avengers Campus can all trace their ancestry back to Lincoln. And in that way, it all started with Lincoln. I love that. That was such a moving pick, Chris. Uh. (laughs) All right. Well, let's head into the last round. What is your last selection? For my last pick, I'm taking Walt's Oscar for Seal Island, his first true-life adventure nature documentary film. This is an important it all started with because it truly started many things for Walt. Because the film debuted before Treasure Island, Seal Island could be argued to be not only Walt's first nature documentary, but Walt's first true foray into fully live-action features. Walt's experience trying to get his distributor to distribute Seal Island also proved to be the beginning of Disney's self-distributing their films, a practice which still continues to this day. Now, why RKO Pictures didn't have full faith by that point in whatever Walt wanted to release is beyond me, but Walt showed them by racking up eight Academy Awards from this series in total. Eight. In that way, it all started with Seal Island. You make some really great points there, Chris. I, I do think that these nature documentaries I mean, as a whole, I think changed the game in film and nature documentaries for um, film across Hollywood and across the world. Uh, We can trace back all the way, you know, from Disney Nature Today, trace it all the way back to Seal Island and the importance of kind of sharing the natural world and why it's important to uh, still have conservation efforts and protect the environment and protect the animals um, that are part of our world. So I think that's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. I mean, they were really some of the first nature documentaries for a general audience, putting the Disney flair, the, uh, you know, little effects animation, uh, fun video effects, uh, as well as audio, you know, Foley sounds and music, uh, all adding that to creating still a true to life uh, picture uh, following real life animals that started all the way back in Bambi. You know, Walt had research footage shot for Bambi, and it was from that where he got the idea that, you know, there were stories about real animals that would be entertaining for people as well. And so that really opened them up for the true life adventures. And part of Walt having the resources that he had was that Alfred and Elma Malott, who were shooting in Alaska on the Privloff Islands for Seal Island, uh, they were really allowed to shoot as much footage as they wanted. Walt knew that he didn't want to miss any little moment that could translate really well on screen. Uh, So with all of that content, they were able to create uh, a really tight film that set up this whole series of documentaries and, you know, documentary films since then 
has been changed for you know the the audience that it's for. So that's why I felt like Seal Island was a, a good one to point out here. Yeah, and the same thing with the self distributing their their films, and that's something that from that point on they continued to do. Um, I think throughout time in the Disney Company, they every time that they tried working with somebody, I think of like Pat Powers or RKO. Um, you know that they decided, okay, we're going to do this on our own and find the resources to figure it out. And I think that's why um, the Walt Disney Company today has been such such a successful company. Was that groundwork laid um, by the founders Walt and Roy? to distribute their films themselves, to figure out how to do it all in-house and not have to rely on another company, a third-party company, to manage any aspect of their filmmaking. Well, and that goes all the way back to the beginning. I mean, you said like Pat Powers, but Pat Powers, um, Charles Mintz, um, really whenever Walt has had to rely on another company, that's another set of board members or executives that he had to respond to. And even in even by the late 40s, early 50s, Walt was still having to answer these questions about, well, you know, we, we're not sure if this film's going to sell. We're not sure how well this is going to do. And Walt was just at that point where he and Roy felt like they could just do it themselves. And that proved to be a successful model for the industry. But, uh, you know, it all goes back to Walt not wanting to be told no by someone else who's not you know, in, entirely wrapped into the, the vision of what he's putting forward. And that Walt, you know, usually had a pretty good eye for what audiences were looking for, even if his distributors did not always. Yeah. And that's actually something interesting. I think from today's point of view, we look back on Walt's history that, oh, everything he touched, like, of course, you know, a nature documentary series was a success um, that because Walt was producing it. It was Walt's idea. Um, but at the time, not everybody knew of the genius that was Walt Disney. And I mean, people were still doubting him when he was putting out Snow White, when he was putting out nature documentaries, and of course, when he was doing Disneyland and developing Disneyland. So, you know, we have the hindsight of being able to see like what a genius and uh, just kind of revolutionary thinker that Walt Disney was. But at the time, not everybody saw it. And of course, we're you know, had their doubts. So it's kind of uh, interesting when you kind of think about that. Totally. Well, I think you have one more pick, Brie, in this collections clash. Well, that was so fun talking about Seal Island. We could probably have chatted about that all day. But for my last selection, it all started with a letter. I'm going with the letter from Walt Disney to Virginia Davis's mother. Now, on October 16th, 1923, the same day, he signed the distribution contract with Winkler Productions. Walt penned this letter to the mother of Virginia Davis, the child actress who portrayed the titular character in Alice's Wonderland. In negotiating the agreement, Margaret Winkler had specified that the same actress should portray Alice in subsequent installments in the Alice comedy series. As a result, Walt implored Davis's mother to allow her daughter to star in the series, praising Virginia's talent and vouching for Winkler's ability to promote the short films. Virginia Davis remembered, quote, when I was four, a letter came from California. My mother was very excited about it, end quote. Davis's parents soon agreed to move the family to California, and Virginia Davis became the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studios' highest paid employee. The date this letter was penned was October 16, 1923, and it's considered the start of the Walt Disney Company. This was the start of it all. It sure was. I always forget that it was the same day that... Uh... Margaret Winkler was like, we need that same little girl to play Alice. And Walt was like, oh, yeah, I got it. And is writing the letter to Virginia Davis's mother at the same time, yep. practically. Making a lot of moves that day. <laughs> yeah, he knew it was going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's always hard to just make three selections. So now it's time for our honorable mentions. These will not be up for voting. My first honorable mention is the famous Herb Ryman Disneyland sketch. Now, we don't have it in the collection, hence why it couldn't clash, uh, but we have it on display in Gallery 9 on the ramp down to the Disneyland model. Now, Brie made a good case earlier about how Disneyland began with the Griffith Park bench, but I'd posit that Walt didn't really know what this perfect all-ages-themed entertainment enterprise was going to look like until over a long weekend, Herb Ryman sketched out the first design of what would become Walt Disney's original Magic Kingdom. I love that. And just kind of seeing that first draft of what a Disneyland could look like and kind of where the evolution, where it even went to, is just so interesting. There's a lot that are still part of that original design and Herb Ryman's first drawing that we see in Disneyland today. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it was different than the Mickey Mouse Park uh, designs that Walt had had, but a consistent theme between all of these designs, they always had a train running around them. Of course. <laughs> Some may say it all started with a train. Um, I almost thought to go that route. But for my first honorable mention, I'm actually going with it all started with Disneylandia. I'm picking our miniature collection on display due to, you know, Walt's interest in miniatures kind of led to a project that he named Disneylandia. And that would be the genesis for the theme park titled Disneyland. So kind of I like how you can see the connective tissue between the two names. Now, Walt spent countless hours carefully constructing the first of his tiny tableaus. The first scene entitled Granny Kincaid's Cabin was based on a set from his live action feature, So Dear to My Heart. Now, the cabin was exhibited at the Festival of California Living at the Pan Pacific Auditorium in Los Angeles from November 28th to December 7th, 1952. A press release announced that it represented the beginning of Walt's new miniature Americana exhibit entitled Disneylandia. Now, Walt became convinced that only a limited audience would be able to visit these tableaus and would be unable to generate the necessary income to pay for their continued maintenance. So, so Disneylandia grew to become Disneyland. Disneyland and Disneylandia is a great connection. And nobody, nobody expected, Brie, that you would pick the miniatures. <laughs> I had a small inkling that I would this round try to find a... Try to find a way to mention the miniatures. <laughs> Every month is miniature May to you. Exactly. Um, <laughs> my next honorable mention is the Snow White music cards that we have on display. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was a first in many respects, but it was also the first commercially available soundtrack. I was sure that we had a soundtrack in our collection, but if we do, it's doing a really good job of hiding, and I really wanted to make this particular point. <laughs> so honorable mention it is. <laughs> well, that was a great point to make, and I think Disney music is such an impactful um, part of Disney and the songs. And we were talking about the Mulan soundtrack. And so to kind of piece it all the way back to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 1937 is just a pretty remarkable feat. Well, my next honorable mention is it all started with the universal camera, what everyone was thinking, right? <laughs> well, it's determined. See, the, the camera theme, it's still going. I love to talk about <laughs> cameras, apparently. Walt's determination to make animated films was realized when on May 23rd, 1922, he incorporated his new studio, Laughagram Films, in Kansas City. Now, he was always experimenting, and he bought a universal Burke and James 35mm hand crank motion picture camera. Whew, that's a mouthful. And tripod. And all for the camera and the tripod, he purchased it for $300. Now, on the weekends, he'd drive through downtown Kansas City, filming the world around him. And with that needed equipment, Walt was able to strike a deal with a non-theatrical distribution company, Pictorial Clubs. Walt did some of the animation, operated the camera, and even performed tasks like washing celluloid sheets so that they could be reused. So this endeavor would lead, unfortunately, to bankruptcy by the end of 1923. But Walt made his way to Hollywood with a one-way ticket to, on the Santa Fe Railroad. And he said, quote, I think it's important to have a good, hard failure when you're young. End quote. I think that kind of rings true. One door closed, another one opened for him. Well, you went camera, and I'm going to go concert. Uh, my <laughs> final honorable mention is our cell of Mickey from 1935's The Band Concert on display in Gallery 3. Uh, the Band Concert was the very first Mickey Mouse cartoon in color. Not as big of a first as the earliest known drawing or Steamboat Willie or Plain Crazy, like I mentioned before, but it certainly set the standard for how Mickey would be perceived in Technicolor moving forward, as well as being an incredible short film in its own regard. What a great pick. I love that. Now for my final honorable mention, this museum was all started by Diane Disney Miller. So taking it all the way home. It's kind of fitting to include the museum story when talking about the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company. Now, while the museum is not affiliated with the company, we have played an integral part in keeping Walt's legacy alive and celebrating his successes and, and even his failures during his lifetime as a way to inspire the next generation of creative talent. Now, Diane was passionate about sharing the man behind the brand, and that is something that we continue to carry the torch on every day. 
And we are just so lucky we can owe everything to uh, Diane and uh, Walter in co-founding our uh, museum. So uh, that is a great way to take us home. And that brings us to the end of our Collections Clash in our episode. Visit our Instagram stories today, October 16th, to vote on your favorite objects or email us at podcast at wdfmuseum.org to cast your votes. Thanks for tuning in to WDFM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on all social platforms at WDF Museum for all the latest updates. It all ended with keep moving forward. Bye. Bye.